afternoon, everyone. So just let me prepare my screen. My presentation itself is, of course, uh, focusing more on the FX outlook uh, amid this current uh, COVID-19 situation. And then subsequently, my colleague will follow up in terms of the uh, product-related advice. So uh, before, uh, let me just make a quick start. I think the second slide itself is actually uh, two paragraphs just to summarize the overall view for G10 FX and also for uh, Asian FX uh, at this point in time. But generally speaking, what I will be doing uh, in the upcoming 15 to 20 minutes is basically to run through with you, uh, starting first with the um, out global outlook on a macro perspective, and also what are the short-term uh, drivers uh, that we are seeing at this point in time. And from there, uh, we filter down towards the FX space and uh, look at how the major currencies uh, will actually move, both in the long term and in the short term. Right, so since this, this whole uh, context is the uh, COVID-19 situation, so let us start with a quick update in terms of uh, what are the key things to look out for in the COVID-19 situation globally. I think uh, one thing to take note is that if the, the global number of confirmed cases, probably now we are at about 5 million people, right? And what we are seeing in terms of the, the virus situation is that there is a third wave in terms of uh, countries that are getting hit by the COVID-19, right? The first wave is your China and your North Asia. The second wave is the other developed economies like uh, Europe and uh, US. And now we are moving down to the third wave, which is basically countries like uh, Russia, Brazil. And in these, so, uh, these EM countries, uh, the numbers are picking up very fast. And these numbers in these EM countries, essentially they are offsetting, right? The decline in numbers seen in uh, North Asia, in Europe and in the US. So as a whole, the daily number of uh, confirmed cases have effectively plateaued, uh, but we still don't see any signs of decline just yet on a global basis, right? Now, moving on, what the key thing to take note is that there is a big disparity in terms of how market participant investors uh, view this situation compared to medical experts, right? Medical experts have always been the more cautious side here, right? Whereas market participants seem very, very happy to impute uh, positivity when it comes to uh, uh, potential vaccines, when it comes to reopening of economies. But the medical experts are the one that keep on uh, trying to pour cold water on this, right? Basically saying that vaccines are, we are nowhere close to a, a, a workable vaccine. Uh, it will take six to 12 months for a vaccine to appear. And also when it comes to reopening of the economies, um, a lot of the medical experts always uh, sound very cautious and they warn against the early, the too early reopening of economies. Now, so how are we seeing the global macro situation in this kind of a context, right? Now, let us look at some of the US data prints first, right? And what we are basically seeing is that a lot of the macroeconomic indicators that we are tracking for the US, they are evolving in a fashion that is consistent to an impending uh, US recession, right? And just, just let me refer you to the top right chart, uh, which is initial jobless claims. Typically, this is a very, very bad chart to show because you don't see uh, any movement. Uh, it's like a horizontal straight line followed by a vertical strike, uh, vertical uh, spike. But this, this kind of chart tells a story, right? Basically, in the other, in the other past episodes of recessions, uh, unemployment rate or jobless claims, they grew very slowly, all right? They picked up over a period of three months or something, right? But what we are seeing now, is this very large initial spike in terms of uh, unemployment, unemployment in the US to the extent that we are starting to see, we are starting to think that this is not really an economic slowdown. It's not a recession as we are used to, right? It is a, basically an economic shutdown in parts of the US, right? So we are expecting uh, the US unemployment rate to reach upwards of 20 or even 25%. So that is one in five or one in four 
people in the US being uh, unemployed, right? And the situation in Europe is worse, right? And if you look at the European PMIs uh, in April, which is the latest set that we had, they were, they were at levels not seen, not even in World War II, right? Or have we seen this kind of uh, economic data coming out of Europe, right? And on top of that, the real impact of this virus spread right, in US and Europe is effectively only two to three months old. Right? The, the hit in Europe came probably in around middle of, middle of March and the US perhaps around the same time. Now, so in terms of recession timelines, we are still very early in terms of uh, the, the development of this particular episode of global recession. So in that sense, there is still a lot of lack of clarity in terms of the economic impact uh, ahead for US and Europe. Now, how about closer to home, right? Closer to home in Asia, we are starting to see also in terms of uh, April manufacturing PMIs, we are starting to see the slump that is reminiscent to your 0809 GFC, right? And in particular, uh, we are seeing the hit uh, being heavier in the South Asian economies and also Southeast Asian economies. Uh, the North Asian economies like Taiwan, uh, Jap sorry, Taiwan, South Korea, they are actually holding on relatively well for now, mainly because uh, they have been hit earlier in terms of the entire uh, timeline in terms of COVID-19 and they were more effective in terms of containing the virus situation. So North Asia is doing slightly better than South Asia at this point in time. However, North Asian economies are very heavy in terms of uh, exports, right? And if the export sector in South Korea is any guide, uh, we should expect the export sector across Asia to continue to turn south, right? In the latest sort of um, first 20 days, May export numbers in South Korea, uh, we have started to see, again, a very strong contraction in terms of uh, South Korean exports. The slight interesting thing here is that if you look at the Nodex numbers, non-all domestic export numbers in Singapore, it is actually holding up pretty well. And the main reason for that is that there is a, there is a, a, a sizable proportion of uh, pharmaceutical exports that has been doing reasonably well in this current context. But nevertheless, right, if we expect the other major economies, US, Europe, to be locked in their own economic issues at this point in time, then it is very difficult for them, it's very difficult for us to expect that they will be uh, demanding a lot of uh, Asian exports at this point in time. The slight positive here is that headline and core inflation numbers are very, very soft across Asia. And this gives the Asian central bank, the Asian, Asian central banks, a lot of room to put in uh, rate cuts uh, in order to support the economy. But by and large, what we are seeing here is that Asian central banks are very pessimistic about their respective outlooks. Right? This morning, we already have uh, the, Singapore M the, the Singapore official uh, growth forecast being cut to minus 7 to minus uh, 4%. Uh, now, the, the threat here is that we will see uh, further downgrades in the months ahead, right? So that is the fundamental view that we have on the macro side. Now, in the short term, in the short term, the issue here is that investor risk settlement is actually reacting very asymmetrically to positive news, right? Any sort of uh, positive headlines, especially from the virus front, seems to get a very uh, strong uh, reaction in terms of uh, in terms of investor risk sentiment, right? And overall, we remain very skeptical about this uh, vaccine and reopening related optimism. We instead prefer to focus on the stress points that are definitely more permanent, such as the macro challenges that I've just set up over the past three slides, and also the rising Sino-US tensions, which I'm sure all of us are very much aware uh, and there is a significant uh, worsening over the, this long weekend that we had. So, nevertheless, having said that, this asymmetric reaction to positive news that we are seeing in the equity markets, in the FX markets, essentially in the short term leaves the dollar bulls a very, 
a difficult wall to climb, a more difficult wall than dollar bears, uh, at least in the very short term. The question here is how long will this positivity, how long will this music actually last? So moving on to the short, short term in terms of the FX developments, right? Uh, in terms of the G10 space, uh, if you look at the broad dollar itself, the broad dollar directionality over the past about one to two months since the start of April is actually very, very diffused. Uh, the dollar index is stuck very much within a range. And as a result, uh, it, it allows the idiosyncratic uh, drivers for the individual pairs to actually step forward and, and determine the directionality of the individual pairs. Now, uh, for Aussie and Kiwi, the antipodians, the cyclicals, uh, we expect them to take cues from the equity markets in the short term, especially the US equity markets. Uh, the euro itself, the euro uh, at this point in time in the near term is very much uh, supported by the German-French uh, unity in terms of pushing through a fiscal package. And this is something that uh, is a reasonably new development. This uh, German-French unity only started last week. Uh, dollar yen itself, uh, dollar yen at least at this point in time seems still very much contained because uh, the gyrations in the risk sentiment is basically offsetting uh, dollar directionality at this point in time. So what you see is that uh, dollar yen effectively should be moving in very tight ranges in the coming sessions. Now, beyond the immediate horizon, right? What, how we determine the relative movements across the different currencies, basically what we are looking at right now is relative central bank dynamics, right? Which central bank is more important, uh, sorry, is more open towards negative interest rates and expanding their asset purchase programs. Basically, the question is simple. Out of the major global central banks, which ones are the most dovish amongst them? Right? All of them are dovish, that's the, that's the basis, but which is the most dovish? Right? And in this respect, what we are seeing is that uh, RBNZ, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and also the Bank of England are the two that is, uh, at least we think, is the most likely to adopt negative uh, policy rates at this point in time. And that has a natural sort of, uh, it weighs against the Kiwi dollar and also the sterling at this point in time. Now, moving on to more longer term perspective. So, so now the time horizon shifts to about three months, right? And, the, and here it is very much dependent on our macro view. And as, as I've explained, the macro view is one that is, uh, in our opinion, very negative. And so typically the dollar is counter cyclical. It tends to, it tends to strengthen when the global economy is weak uh, due to the safe haven dynamics, right? So at least at this point in time, we continue to expect that global macroeconomic uh, indicators is continuing to soften. And as a result, uh, the dollar should broadly remain supported. Now, there is this other question which I get quite often in uh, these presentations, and that is uh, the Federal Reserve's QE, QE program, the quantitative easing program, right? They are printing so much money in layman terms. They are printing so much money. How can the dollar still be strong, right? I think there are two ways to understand this. Number one, uh, it is not just uh, the Fed that is printing money, right? Across the world, all the major central banks are doing quantitative easing to a certain extent simultaneously at the same time, right? And as a result, the, the impact on the impact, sorry, the, sorry, the impact on the FX markets is actually very much diffused. And that is the main thing why uh, we don't see this weakening uh, in the dollar as a result of the quantitative easing. And the other thing is that for the dollar to weaken this liquidity that is now introduced to the US uh, financial system, it has to flow out of the US. It has to flow out through uh, portfolio flows, basically to buy uh, foreign assets or for the US to import more goods. So it flows out as, uh, as, 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 as um, uh, funds paid towards uh, other uh, uh, companies in other countries, right? Are we seeing this kind of portfolio outflows or an increase in uh, US imports? No, not yet, right? So it is preventing 
the, the dollar from weakening in that sense. Right? So these are the two main reasons why even though there is a QE program, uh, we are not seeing a significant weakening in terms of the dollar itself. Now, moving on to Asia. Now, if you, if you listen to the Asian central banks, the government officials, uh, analysts, macroeconomists, some of them are basically telling you that this particular crisis is worse than 0809. The worse than the 0809 GFC, right? And if you, if you take that view that this is going to be as bad, if not worse than the 0809 crisis, then you need to look at how is the Asian currencies reacting. Typically, when you suffer from a, a recession in an Asian economy, the currency needs to depreciate in order to spur exports, uh, in order to support the economy, right? So how is this dollar Asia adjustment uh, this particular time? And if you look at the table that I have on the, on the screen and comparing the peak to trough movement that we have seen this time round versus the 08-09 GFC, basically we are nowhere near, right? We are about only half the extent of uh, what we have seen in the global financial crisis. So the adjustment in terms of dollar Asia is still not sufficient to, to support the economy just yet. And that is the fundamental reason why we are negative on uh, Asian currencies as a whole. And if you look at how in recent one to two weeks, a lot of the central banks are again stepping up in terms of uh, warning about their risk in terms of their economic outlook, then uh, we again get this view that uh, the Asian currencies are perhaps too resilient uh, at this point in time compared to uh, their macroeconomic uh, picture, right? I think the key reason why this is so is that a lot of investors in Asia continue to expect a V-shaped recovery, right? And this V-shaped recovery uh, allows them to, to look past the, the negative economic uh, developments because they think it will be re very, very short-lived, right? But again, uh, is this going to be true? Is this uh, V-shaped recovery uh, going to materialize at least based on what we are hearing from the Asian uh, central banks? It does not seem to be the case. Of course, the other factor is the Sino-US tensions. And I, at least at this point in time, it seems to me that a lot of investors are taking heart that uh, the Sino-US tensions are not explicitly boiling over. They are not explicitly uh, bursting out uh, and it remains relatively contained at this point in time. So again, the question is, are these uh, Asian currency, uh, pro-Asian currencies drivers uh, actually going to be sustainable? Our view is uh, not so. Now, the other thing, one, most, one of the most sustainable reasons why Asian currencies have held up well is that foreign reserves in Asia are actually uh, doing reasonably well. It's reasonably flat uh, since, since the start of the year, even though we have had this crisis. So uh, in a structural horizon, that is a, a positive for Asian currencies. But uh, again, this is going to be very long term. Is it is this, just, is this enough to hold up the Asian currencies? Uh, again, uh, we, we are skeptical about that. Now, so all in all, in terms of Asian currencies, we are still uh, looking for dollar Asia upside. Dollar Asia upside basically just means that uh, the Asian currencies will continue to weaken. Uh, the, the flip side to that story is that we do expect uh, this to be a slow grind, right? And the reason is that... Uh, there is not, there is, there isn't an evidence uh, in terms of uh, significant portfolio outflows out of Asia, or at least there is no worsening. Uh, the next two slides you will see a little bit more of that. Uh, but the key thing in the short term is this asymmetric uh, reaction to uh, positive news, right? So as long as uh, this asymmetric uh, reaction to positive news uh, supports the risk environment, then the Asian. Uh, the Asian currencies will continue to stay relatively resilient against the dollar. The, the key sort of catalyst for weaker Asian currencies right now, we think in the near term will definitely be a significant worsening in terms of uh, the Sino-US tensions. And if that really materializes, then we expect uh, the dollar North Asia currencies and the dollar sink to actually be most reactive higher. So there will be most 
weakening in terms of the Sing dollar and other North Asian uh, currencies. Whereas the South Asian currencies, at least at this point in time, seems to be uh, very much running on their own uh, domestic drivers at this point. So again, let me just uh, show this uh, portfolio flows picture. Uh, there has been significant improvement over the past um, six weeks, six to eight weeks. But nevertheless, these improvements have started to slow. And in particular, if you look at uh, the cumulative flow picture, we are starting to see again uh, re, re worsening in, in particular Taiwan, uh, equity outflows from Taiwan. Whereas in the rest of the South Asian countries, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, India, basically they are still seeing a very slow grind in terms of uh, portfolio outflows. Now, let me just end off uh, very quickly uh, on the Sing side. And, and this obviously had a lot of uh, developments this morning. Right? Uh, if I may just, uh, re just do a quick recap, uh, this, this morning our first quarter GDP actually slumped 4.7%, uh, uh, contracted 4.7% on a Q on Q basis. And the other key thing, of course, is that uh, going forward, the full year 2020 growth forecast is being cut to minus 7 to minus 4% from minus 4 to minus 1%. Now, uh, what we have been saying for the Sing dollar is that uh, up till the previous downward revision, which is the one that got revised, the growth forecast got revised to minus, minus 4 to minus 1, uh, we had the Sing near at around the parity level. So right now, with this further downgrade in terms of uh, growth forecast, we do expect the currencies, uh, the Sing dollar, to have to organically weaken further in order to adjust to the soft, softer than expected macroeconomic climate. So are we expecting the, the Sing near to move to the bottom end of the policy spectrum? No, not just yet. Why? Because uh, most of the support in terms of uh, the, the, the economic support should come from fiscal policy. Right immediately after this particular, uh, this particular webinar, of course, everybody will then be tuning into DPMH right, for the fourth, fourth budget. So the fiscal side will, will do the heavy lifting and not the monetary and the uh, FX side. But having said that, we still expect the senior to weaken ever so slightly uh, in order to account for the weak weaker macroeconomic climate that we have in Singapore right at this point. In. Now for dollar sing. So dollar sing, uh, it, again, it has been very much uh, in a corridor uh, between 141 and 143 against the dollar. So again, uh, it will take a strong catalyst uh, for the dollar sing to break out of this range. Right? And so far, um, what comes across as a, a, a key catalyst, a potential catalyst is the Sino-US tensions. Right? And as a result, uh, we do expect uh, the dollar, the dollar sink to edge closer towards the 1.143 uh, top end of the recent band. And uh, from then on, then we will have to take a look at uh, what are the developments at that point in time and whether uh, we, can actually, um, we can actually break through the 143 handle. So let me just summarize all in all uh, uh, this particular uh, presentation, right? Basically, uh, the key takeaway here is that we do expect the macroeconomic outlook to worsen, right? Or to at least remain very, very heavy in the next three months or so. And as a result, uh, we still prefer to back the dollar as one of the safest havens around. And so that, that sort of draws upon the safe haven dynamics uh, for the dollar itself, but in the near term, in the near term, we will need to focus very much in terms of uh, risk sentiment, and risk sentiment continues uh, to be very well supported. Uh, investors continue to react asymmetrically towards positive news and overlook negative news, and as a result, that makes uh, the dollar very hard to sort of strengthen in the near term. Right. Uh, so that is my segment. I will just uh, pause the screen share and then uh, I think uh, can, I can also introduce uh, the next speaker. Uh, that will be Yen, uh, my colleague. Uh, so I'll pass the time back to uh, Tiffany and uh, Yen. 
Okay, can you share? Thanks, Terence. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Okay, um, next up we have with us is Mr. Yen Gobaja, Associate Director of Corporate Sales and Structuring of Global Treasury. He'll be talking more about like how the different FX structure products may help businesses. So over to you, Yen. Hello. Hi. Okay. Give me a second. Let me get the screen set up. Uh... Yeah, probably we need you to on the video. Too. Yep. Same. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for introducing and for to Terence for the macroeconomic update, which I must say sounds pretty gloomy. I think with all the volatility that you've been seeing in the market, I think some are probably very concerned or at least very affected by all of this uncertainty, especially in the FX market and seeing as how Singapore is such an open trading economy. I think uh, quite a fair bit of us have to deal with this one way or the other. So a quick introduction, quick, very quick introduction. Name is Ian. I'm from uh, the Treasury Corporate Sales and Structuring team. As a team, we primarily cover FX, fixed income, interest rates, uh, investments and other market related products. But I think today I'll be focusing mainly on the FX component, uh, which is the basics, the risks, hedging, so on and so forth. And quick glimpse on what we shall be discussing today. Uh, from the very basic to not so basic, we've got spot, forward, time option, ratio forward, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's a non-exhaustive list of what we have in our library, and I'll be taking you through it step by step, time permitting. So let us begin with the bare basics that I believe most people know, which is just the FX spot. Uh, essentially, it's the purchase of one currency and sale of another. You buy one, sell the other, as and when you need it. Um, I think most of us will be quite familiar with this. So moving on, example is right here. Um, say you need, in this scenario rather, I, what I use is that uh, you are an exporter, so to speak, and you receive dollar and you, your, your books are in sync, so your expenses are in sync, and you need to sell dollar to cover those expenses. So assuming today's trade day is 27 April 2020, you do a standard regular spot in which you sell dollar against sync for two business days later, which is the typical spot day at 1.42. All it means is that uh, uh, two days later on 29 April, you have to sell to the bank US 1 million and buy Sing 1.42 million. So all very simple, straightforward. I think more importantly, uh, people who are curious on how to hedge will be more interested in what we have, which is the FX forward and time option. So forward is essentially a hedging tool that removes the FX volatility for whichever time period you need it to be. It's a forward contract that it allows a customer to buy sell one currency for another currency like the spot, but at a rate which is agreed today, for delivery at an agreed future date. So I don't know how many of you have done this before, but basically you're locking in the rate today for whatever timing you need. And then a common question I, I tend to get from my clients is that, are forward contracts always more expensive? And I would say no. It depends on whether there's a premium or discount on currency pair. Again, difficult to say which currency pair will always be a premium, which one will always be a discount, which one will be more expensive, which one will be cheaper because uh, it's dependent on the interest rate parity and rates move every day, all day, every month, every year. I mean, for those who've done it before, dollar sing, if you hit the, the offer side a couple of years ago, it was premium, but now it's discount because the rates have crashed so much. The second variation we have will actually be the time option. It's a bit like a FX forward, but instead of having a fixed state, you have a time range. So time option contract allows you to, again, buy, sell one currency for another currency at a rate which is agreed today for delivery in the future time period. So let me just try and see what I can explain how, what that means. So um, forward contract, again, assuming that you need to sell US dollars, right? Um, for one month, today, again, let's say assuming it's 27 April 2020, you fix a forward for 27 May at 1.42 to sell dollar, which means that on 27 May and only on 27 May, no other day, not before, not after, but the exact day itself for forward, you have to sell to the bank 1 million US and to buy saying 1.42 million at the previously fixed rate of 1.42. But for a time option, it's different because uh, if you enter into a similar set of circumstance where you fix a one month time option, instead of buying exactly on 27 May, you are able to purchase anytime from 28 April to 27 May at 1.42 at whatever sum you want. So maybe on 29th April, you can buy five US dollars for 1.42. Sorry, rather you can sell five US dollars for 1.42. On the 2nd of May, you sell 500K. On the 7th of May, you sell 50K. It doesn't matter. As long as by the end, the expiry date of 27 May 2020, you have used up your entire 1 million US. That's 
the difference between the time option and forward. So it gives you a bit more flexibility. So then the question comes, why not just always do a time option? What's the point of doing a forward if a time option seems to give you more flexibility? Well, there are two very simple reasons. First of all would be for currency pairs that have a discount, as a time option, you don't get to enjoy the discount. So like uh, for now, uh, dollar sing, oh, not anymore actually, but maybe a couple of months ago, dollar sing, if you were to buy dollar sing on a forward, it would be cheaper on a forward than a spot. So a spot could be 1.42, but a forward would be what, 1.4175. But in time option, there is no discount. It'll just be the same as what it'll be par at 1.42 as well. And second of all, time option may or may not also have a premium because there's a price to the flexibility. And again, that depends on the market pricing and depends on a whole lot of factors which you won't know until we need it. So that's uh, the trade-off between time option and forward. So you will need to do your own uh, calculations to see whether it's pretty much worth it or not. So that's uh, what we have. And moving on from the more vanilla kind of uh, spot forward and uh, uh, time options, we approach slightly more complex FX hedging structures. So just, just let me set a scene, okay? You're a typical trading company. You purchase your goods from various suppliers in the US and you distribute it locally in Singapore, which basically means that you have dollar payables to pay them and you're seeing receivables in a single dollar book to cover your expenses as well, uh, whichever you need. So what that leaves you is, is a currency mismatch, in which case you have a couple options, uh, three of which I've already spoken. First of all, you can just buy spot as and when you need. Um, whenever you need to buy dollar, you just buy dollar. You need to pay your supplier, you just pay your supplier off the spot market. But that actually leaves you with uh, at the mercy of the FX market. So if you need to buy dollar, if it moves up, then that unfortunately it becomes more expensive for you in terms of sing dollar. But of course, if the dollar against a uh, dollar sing drops as well, then it is to your advantage because it is now cheaper to buy dollar. Um, perhaps in the past that would make sense because uh, dollar sing may or may, may not have been so volatile. So your profit margin might be able to hedge that or not rather hedge, but your profit margin could buffer that kind of FX volatility. But I mean, you see in the recent weeks and months, right, dollar sing has been moving up so much back and forth, so high, so low. Uh, basically, it's more movement in a shorter period of time. And you may no longer be so confident that the, the profit margin could actually buffer this, or perhaps with uh, business slowing down, your margins are down as well, and you're a bit more concerned about what you can do with that. So spot may not always be the best idea in terms of hedging. Then you have forwards and time options, and you can buy as and when uh, you have requirements, and okay, you fix it at whatever rate you get then. But there's always a third option, which is what we call FX structures. And this generally uh, helps to attain a better rate as, as, as uh, opposed to just simple spot forward time options. Um, but of course, there's a catch to this, which I will expand upon later. Let's just start with a very straightforward ratio forward and um, we'll move our way down to, or rather up to more complex structures. Uh, so in this case, the parameters are, you are a dollar buyer. So you need to buy dollar against saying maybe in six months, uh, you are purchasing some sort of material or goods that's coming six months later, the bill is due six months later. Uh, you therefore would like to figure out what should you do to hedge out this risk. For this structure, uh, we use the 10 of six months and the notional amount of dollar 100 by 200K. So again, we assume that this time the spot reference is 1.35. So if you were to buy dollars in today, it'll be at 1.35. And the strike rate would be 100 basis points better at 1.34. So what this means is that by entering into this structure, six months later, you observe where the dollar thing is. If it's above 1.34, like uh, maybe it's at 1.38, 1.37, then it's great because you get to buy US 100K at 1.34. But then of course the catch is that if it goes below 1.34, if it drops to 1.33, you have to buy double the amount uh, USD 200K at 1.34. So essentially what you do is you fix the rate, but not the amount. It could be USD 100K or 200K, depending on the final fixing. A bit more suitable for clients who are comfortable with the strike rate, like to fix it there, and are also comfortable with the varying notional amount, USD, 100 or 200K. That's the uncertainty over there. So very simple, very straightforward. Um, above 3.4, good. Below 3.4, not so good. And of course, we have a lot of different variations. Let's uh, push it up a bit more. This is the scenario analysis for the ratio forward. Uh, have a look at your own time. Basically, we're just adding in numbers uh, to help you see uh, to, to help you visualize exactly how the structure works. And any questions, feel free to contact us after this. Next one would be a barrier forward. As the name implies, it has a barrier feature in it. 
In this case, it will be a knockout. Parameters, a bit different. Spot reference, still 1.35. Tenor, still six months. Notional amount, still 1.2 to try and keep it very constant. But this time, the strike is better at 3.350 instead of 1.34, as you saw before. And how do we get that? We add in a knockout rate of 1.4. We call this a European because that means that the knockout rate is only observed on one date, which is the expiration date six months later. And what again, what this knockout adds in is that if six months later, dollar saying strengthens to the point that it is above 1.4, which means it's really strong, this whole structure knocks out and you're not hedged. Okay, so that's that risk there where it's above 1.4, there is no hedge. But in return, you get a better strike rate of 50 basis points. You get 1.335 instead of 1.34. So above 1.4, nothing happens. In between 3350 and 1.4, also good. You get a buy at 3350, 100K. But once it goes below 1.3350, you must buy double at, uh, or you'll have to buy 200K at 1.3350. So the idea behind this is that it's suitable for clients who believe that the dollar sing is unlikely to appreciate beyond a specific level, which in this case, is the knockout rate of 1.4. So if you don't think that six months later, dollar is going to go past 1.4 because it's so far from where it is now, then this would make a bit more sense because it gives you a bit of a better strike rate. Right, so therefore that's where they bear in. Also note that there are quite a few variations on the bear rate forward. There's the American version where the observation period is through the entire life, entire six months. There's a KI, which is a knocking rate. It's a completely different payout as well. But I think this is just to let you have a better idea. And if you have more questions, you can always contact your TA as well. Then we'll move on to the scenario analysis. Yes, again, please feel free to take a look at it. Any questions come back. It's just to give you a better visual idea of how this structure works. And move on to the range forward. Okay, range forward. Well, it's another variation again. Instead of, a, let me think. Okay, so the, the idea is a bit different. The terms and conditions are the same. We use one by two, six months, spot again 1.35. But this time we have two strike rates instead of one. You have one at 3375, <clears throat> slightly lower than 34, and one above 3425. So the concept here is that it allows the client to participate in any dollar sing depreciation up to the lower strike rate of 3375 with upper cap of 3425. So at the end of six months, if you are above 3425, then you get to buy at 3425 USD 100K. If you are below 3375, you buy double 200K US at 3375. But if it falls in between, if it fixes at like 35, then you are able to buy or not buy at whatever prevailing spot rate it is then as much as you want. So it allows you to be more flexible within a range of the 50 basis points range versus the first one we saw, which is a ratio forward where your strike is fixed directly on 0.34. So this one gives you a bit more, I wouldn't say flexibility, but Potentially, you can get a bit better at 3375, but at the same time, you also may get worse if it's like 3410, 3405 instead of, uh, of 1.34. So a bit of different kind of structure for the different kind of clients and where they view or what they feel the dollar thing we're moving towards. Again, this can be applied for basically every currency out there. The idea here is to let you have a look at what are the different so potential solutions to your FX uh, roles that in this uh, rather unpredictable environment. Then again, scenario analysis, quick look, you can see, and any questions, please feel free. Finally, a seagull, okay. Um, it's, 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 it's interesting, it's named because if you actually draw the payoff diagram, it looks a bit like a bird. So that's where we got the name seagull from. A Little bit more complicated. Uh, you saw one strike, you saw two strikes, you saw one strike and one KO. This time we have three different strikes. So. Uh, take a bit more time to try and slow down and try to fig help you figure out, help us figure all this out. So we use the similar conditions where you have to buy dollar against saying, tenor is six months, notional is one by two, 100K by 200K. Spot reference as usual is 1.35. So three different strikes. Lowest is 3.3, three, three. middle is 3.350, three, three, upper is 3.450. So all pretty close, but yeah. So um, how this is different is that uh, Everything you've seen before this, once it goes above the upper strike rate, which is 3450, you buy single at 3450, correct? But for a seagull, you don't. What happens is that if it's above 1.3450, you don't get a fixed rate of 3450, you get a subsidy. 
So any rate above 3450 fixing, you get 100 basis points lesser. So in six months, if it's 1.4, you get to buy 1.39. If it's 1.37, you buy 1.36. So you won't know where it is. That's, how, that's essentially the difference. And in return for this, you losing out the fact that there's a fixed rate on the top side, look at a lower strike rate, which is much lower. It's at 1.33 versus the 3.4 and 3.3.4, 3, 3.3.5.0 days before. Only when it goes below 1.33, do you have to buy double 200K at 1.33. It's what's in the middle that's interesting. In between the upper and middle strike rate, which is 3.3.5.0 uh, and 3.4.5.0, it functions like a typical uh, structure you saw before, you buy 100K at 3350. But in between 3350 and 33, there's an empty range there where you are able to purchase as much as you want at the prevailing rate, a bit similar to what the range for is. So essentially remember three, above 3450, you get a subsidy between 3350 and 3450, you buy at 3350. Between 3350 and 33, there's no settlement. And below 1.33, you buy double at 1.33. So Yep, again, you give up something, you get something back. That's essentially how the nature of all these FX structures work. It's all a combination of what you're willing to, to give up to get back and essentially what your view is on the dollar thing and so on and so forth. I also added in, uh, okay, sorry, scenario analysis. Again, have a look, maybe this will help. Um, again, any questions, please feel free to ask later or contact us after this is over. I added in a DCR. Okay, it's, it's strictly not hedging, but I found it interesting and that it applies to the current situation, this so COVID driven economic meltdown that we seem to be having, which is that the dollar sink volatility has shot up quite a fair bit. It's a lot higher than what you've seen in the last one, two, three, even four years. And as a result, um, for those who are aware what DCR is, it is a short term FX link investment product that uh, allows you to potentially enjoy a higher interest rate as compared to uh, your regular deposit. So in this case, I put a, uh, let's say, sink base of 1 million, your alternate currency of uh, dollar, 10 or 1 month, spot rate 3.6, strike 1.35. If, well, essentially, if you are comfortable with having either dollar or sink and you have requirements for both, then this would make a bit more sense. And why is because since the balls are a lot higher, volatility has shot up so much, if you were to look at current DCR rates, it will be a fair bit higher than the last three years I would wager. It's a lot more uh, attractive in terms of the yield. I think in the past, maybe you'll see one, two, three, four percent. Now we can actually see 5% if the strike is close enough to the spot rate. So um, just want to put it out there for people who want to have a look. Um, yeah, in this case, all you're doing is that you're putting a same sort of uh, investment for a month and the end of one month, depending on the strike, you're going to get back dollars saying the interest of, uh, for here, yeah, put a yield as 2.5%, is guaranteed. You're definitely going to get a 2.5%. Seeing as how both uh, dollar and sing rates, I think the FD rates now are terrible. So this is something you may wish to consider um, to take advantage of the higher volatility in this period as well. So I think with that, um, I again added in a sensitivity analysis, but you have a look to see where your break even is, uh, where it makes better sense and where you should not have done. Or, and yeah, you can have a look at it. Any questions, please feel free. Um, I think that's about it. I have wrapped up my end. Thanks to Terence. I hope uh, for those who already know this, this was not a bit too boring for you. For those who don't, I hope this can help you out future. And any questions, please feel free to share with us right now. I'll hand it over back to Kathleen. Okay, Kesha. Thanks, Yen. Thanks so much for the presentation. Okay, now uh, before we start off with the Q and A session, because moving forward we'll be uh, proceeding on to Q and A. Just a quick announcement that for the presentation deck, it will be sent to all the participants via email after the webinar session. But do give us a couple of working days to edit the presentation. Uh, to edit the pre uh, presentation deck before we send it to the participants. So. Now, let us welcome back the two speakers for the Q&A session. Um, as usual, if you have any questions for the speakers, feel free to submit them by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. Do note that as we have limited time for the Q&A questions, we will not be able to answer all questions. And trust, if you uh, we seek your kind understanding that should your questions not be answered during the, this session, please contact OCBC Bank uh, directly which we will also be sending you their contact details after the event. 
or email SCCCI and we will forward your inquiries to them too. So now let us uh, invite back Yen or so um, to be back on the line. Parents, I see that you're on the line here. And while we have, um, you know, people typing in their questions, everything, okay, maybe I'd um, like to just start the ball rolling uh, with uh, quite a few of the questions that we have heard, um, you know, uh, from the participants previously. So maybe the first question maybe is more towards Terence, okay? So during this COVID-19 period, right, uh, overall, how would you find Singapore dollar's performance against the rest of the currencies, probably the major currencies, you know, moving forward in the next couple of six months? Yep. What do you feel about it in general for the Singapore currencies itself? Uh, for the Singapore currency, I think if you if you look at uh, ac across the Asian, comparing across the Asian currencies, actually the 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 performance is actually quite middling. So it, it doesn't really stand out both uh, in terms of outperformance or underperformance. So uh, I would say compared to the the compared to the other Asian currencies, it's actually quite a uh, very right smack in the middle, uh, I would say. But going forward, I think that's the key. Going forward, uh, because we do expect the main catalyst to be Sino-US issues, right? And when it comes to Sino-US issues, uh, economies that are more open to trade with China tends to get a bigger hit. So more open economies tend to be, get the biggest hit. And that is where uh, countries like Singapore, countries like South Korea, uh, we'll get uh, we'll get we'll get a shorter end of the straw, and uh, as a result, I would say going forward, if we indeed see significant uh, weakening in terms of uh, the Sino-US trade issues, uh, we do expect um, the Singapore currency to sort of start to gradually underperform. Okay, and moving with the, since you're talking about the Sino uh, war issues and everything, do you think that the USD will continue to strengthen? And or you really find that USD has probably really reached its peak, you know, at all time high, or there's still room for you know moving for uh, moving uh, strengthening the USD dollars in general. Uh, definitely, there is still room for the dollar to strengthen. I think uh, as as we have sort of uh, touched on earlier in the presentation itself, uh, in in most circumstances where we see a significant downturn in terms of uh, the global macroeconomic outlook. Uh, the dollar tends to stand out as the, the main sort of uh, risk, so the, the main safe haven currency, right? And uh, that kind of picture has not changed, right? Uh, what would actually change our dollar view in a three, sort of a three-month kind of time horizon is if we see um, more evidence of um, more evidence of a V-shaped recovery as more and more economies uh, start to reopen. Uh, sad to say, uh, we still do not see significant evidence on that front just yet. If you look at China, China is uh, effectively the first in, first out in terms of the virus outbreak. Uh, Chinese economy has started to open up, but uh, we are still seeing a very weak uh, domestic demand uh, in China itself. The, the production has, has, has improved, right? But that is easy. That is supply side. The government come in and say, you have to produce, you will produce. So the, the, the industrial production side, it's okay. But in terms of retail sales, in terms of uh, exports, uh, these two areas are still very heavy. So I think um, it's too early to call for, for a V-shaped recovery at this point. Okay, Kensha. Thanks, Terence. Thanks for the insights on your view um, about the currencies. Uh, moving forward, I do have quite a few questions. Uh, it's more for Yen's side. So, Yen, I do have someone asking, you know, talking about all the hedging instruments uh, moving forward, you know. So, what are the requirements for the forward? Is there a minimum amount? Yeah, I do get a lot of SMEs asking about this question. Maybe what are some, uh, is there a minimum amount that they must commit or they must purchase uh, the Forex? And, um, you know, other than forwards, what other instruments can they use to hedge? Yeah, so probably you can talk a bit more about it. Uh, requirements for forwards, uh, first and foremost, you need to approach your RM to ensure that they are able to load the forward lines for you. As for a minimum amount, most of us don't really have that. We just uh, will be happy to quote whatever you need to do. But I think essentially you need the paperwork done, which is the lines from the RM. 
Other than forwards, I think, uh, like I mentioned, there were FX structures as well, a little bit more complex than forwards. But if you want a more straightforward kind of, uh, I mean, if you want a more straightforward forward would be the case to be because that's where uh, it's, 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 it's very simple. You just fix the rate today for the rate you need in the future. And primarily it's used to typically fix in your profit. If you know that you're going to sell this product at a certain price and you're purchasing another price, you do a forward, then you have no more FX risk. The only risk you have is, uh, or rather, since FX is not really a controllable risk, then you would remove that factor and just focus on the business risk itself on whether you can move that product. Okay, can share. Thanks, Ian. Okay, uh, on top of it, um, you know, on top of these questions, right? I think in the another participant is also asking about, you know, oh, so many FX hedging tools that you have previously. You are saying, you know, which one you you reckon is the least riskier tool? You know, especially for SME company who is quite lean, or or especially during this volatile period, you know, we are not really sure. You know, what is a couple of coming months? What will happen to businesses and stuff? So maybe. Would you, you know, take a view on which one is the better or, you know, preferred tools? I think it will depend primarily on the situation they are in. Uh, for example, if you a forward, the thing about a forward is that you don't have to buy it now. So um, if you have dollar requirements in six months, you fix a forward, the cash outflow only happens six months later versus you buy a spot and hold it for six months. So that's where I would say is the least ris risky because it's the simplest. But then you look at structures, uh, again, I wouldn't say it's any less or more risky. The, the risk you hold now is whether the amount, like I mentioned before, the rate is fixed, but the amount is not for some structures. And for some companies who have uh, spare cash, they don't mind holding on to the dollar. They don't mind buying more and keeping it or buying less and purchasing off spot. So I think it's, a, it's difficult to say which one is the least risky. I can say which is the least complex and therefore the most straightforward, which would then be the time option to forward. Uh, all the different FX structures, they have their own place for the kind of risk appetite you have or the kind of specific situation that your company is in. It's a little bit too broad for me to explain or rather to, to kind of answer as in which one is the best. That's not always the best. If that's the best, then we won't need to bother with so many different uh, kind of a product. We just use that one. But I think we try to tailor make to the individual company. So we need to speak a bit in depth about where your company situation is before we can try and figure out which one would be most ideal. I understand from down there because I understand that different uh, companies have different needs and wants. So probably for those participants who want to find out more about, you know, how to go about hedging, our uh, best is to approach OCBC Bank, you know, contact their RMs or contact, uh, you know, experts to see and analyze, you know, what kind of uh, company you are. And, you know, from down there, they'll be able to give you the best solution from it. And, you know, on top of it, uh, just another question by Annie or so, I think it's also regarding the hedging. Is there a um, you know, a minimum shortest period. Is it six months or, you know, within one month from the presentation, I saw that is, you know, one month difference kind of thing. Or, you know, can it be like just two weeks or is there like a minimum number or maximum duration for the hedging? A forward is very flexible. Uh, you can have it 17 days. You can have 47 days. You can have it specifically for as and when you need it. If you know that you're paying something in 49 days, we can do that as well. It's no problem. The only... I think a factor that limits it would be, as I mentioned, the limits that you have, whether the, the RM is willing to give you six months, 12 months, 24 months, all depends on that. But in terms of flexibility, there is maximum flexibility for forward. Time option okay. as well. Okay, Ken Shia, thanks Yen. Thanks for the feedback itself. Okay, I think I have another question that's moving back to Terence. Okay, Terence, you know, we previously we are talking about the Sino-US relation. So someone's asking whether will this situation cast an overcast on the Hong Kong security laws issues or probably can you talk a bit about, you know, with these uh, tensions going on, will it, you know, cause a issue on the Hong Kong economy or so in general? Yeah, I think... Uh... The, the Hong Kong side uh, is definitely one branch of the, the entire sort of Sino-US conflicts, right? Uh, apart from Hong Kong, uh, there, is, there, there are also things like uh, the blacklisting of tech companies by the US side. Uh, we have Huawei issues. Uh, we have uh, who started the virus. Is it the, is it the Wuhan lab? Or did they deliberately fly people to the US to spread the virus, so on and so forth, right? So the Sino-US relations is, is at least at this point in time, very multifaceted. Uh, and it has gone beyond just the, the usual things that we have been talking about last year, 
like Hong Kong, like uh, Huawei, towards uh, also the virus. So I think that there is too many sort of, uh, there, there are too many branches of this issue that we need to keep track on. And uh, we need to get a more holistic view of the situation right now. And as for Hong Kong, I think um, the economy itself will, will continue to be very resilient, right? And uh, of course, this security law comes in as a little bit of a shock uh, for some of the observers, uh, at least in terms of how fast it was, uh, it was implemented uh, and basically without a significant uh, consultation. But uh, by and large, I think the, the Hong Kong economy uh, has, has weathered through a lot of uh, such uh, surprises very well over the past, well, since 1997 when they, they hand over to China, uh, since 1997 when the handover took place. So I think the, the Hong Kong economy will continue to be resilient. And uh, unless there is more deliberate attempts to, to marginalize Hong Kong, which uh, at least at this point in time, we don't see any evidence of as of now. Okay, I hope that, thanks Terence, uh, I hope that answers one of the participants' question. Okay, we've come to the you know, last question itself before we end off the whole uh, event. Uh, for participants who want to know more about aging and you know, uh, the different uh, types of products itself, uh, as spoken, you can actually email OCBC directly to find out more details. So I do have the last questions, I think it's more towards Terence or so. You know, uh, after projecting all the different views about the different currencies, you know, probably the the participants will also have this question on which currency do you think is the most suitable, uh, most stable one to invest in at the current situation? You know, like previously, I do have someone saying that, oh, yen is also one of the safe havens, but yen has seems to be, you know, sliding down. And then now USD is so strong, but, you know, you know, probably there's going to be downside more than, you know, upside is moving forward kind of thing. So probably what would you, um, you know, advise for participants on which are the more, stable currencies to invest on moving forward? Uh, I, I think, I think uh, to, to understand that question, we need to see uh, the individual participants, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, currency uh, demands that they have uh, in terms of uh, their company's uh, flows and things like that. So I think that is, it, it's not like uh, buying a stock, right? Whether uh, OCBC is safer than DBS or is safer than UOB and things like that. It really depends on the individual investor's uh, time horizon, the individual investor's uh, uh, demands of the different currencies. For example, if, if, you are a, if you are a company that has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, income that is denominated in uh, dollars, right, then your natural, your natural um, your natural interest will be in the dollar sing rate. And that will be the safest for you to, to, to keep track of and for you to, you know, if you really want uh, to hedge or anything like that, right? To invest in or to hedge. So that is the most natural, um, natural pair to take note of. I, I wouldn't say it is the best or the safest or anything like that. But I think depending on the individual, uh, individual company or the individual's indi uh, requirements, there is definitely one or two uh, currency pairs that is the most natural uh, to be involved in. Yeah. Okay, Kensha, thanks, Terence. Um, yep, I do agree with you. Depending on each individual company, uh, you know, what's your needs are, you know, moving forward, whether are you in USD, yen, or, you know, um, all the different euro currencies and stuff. Okay, we have come to the end of our presentation. Thanks, Terence, and thanks, Yen, um, you know, from OCBC Bank team, you know, to be giving such an insightful presentation uh, for our participants. I hope all the participants have a great idea and insight about the current Forex uh, currencies and outlook. And, you know, if you would like to find out more about, you know, future SCCCI events, uh, please do visit our SCCCI website. And we do have a list of, you know, um, all the different kinds of webinar that's definitely, um, you know, uh, good for the participants to listen off. So, you know, moving forward, thanks Terence, thanks Yen so much and we've come to the end of our presentation. Thank you for today's uh, presentations and stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. Thank thanks. you.